Courses are reaching every corner of the globe with over 55,000 views of our webinars so far. We're forging new partnerships, signing agreements with 12 other international academic societies, and building an enduring network we hope will last for many years to come. So, what can you expect from us? Free webinars led by key opinion leaders from around the world and across all fields of orthopedic surgery and traumatology, as well as chat shows with some of the most interesting and inspiring surgeons on the planet. Opportunities to take an interactive role in these webinars by participating in polls and live discussions. Free on-demand Pioneer playback service. Watch our webinars again and again in your own time. And coming soon, our new bespoke learning management system will host podcasts, an online version of the famous SICOT diploma exam, virtual training modules, surgical technique courses, a discussion forum, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us on this pioneering journey as we push the boundaries of what is possible in online orthopedic education together. A very good afternoon. Good evening to all everyone logging on to the SICOT Pioneer webinar uh, from all over the world. I'm Gauri Santevendran, uh, consultant orthopedic surgeon at Mount Elizabeth Hospital, Navina, Singapore. I'm chair of the Education Academy at SICOT, and it's an absolute pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you on the SICOT Pioneer platform logging on from various corners of the world. It is indeed an honor this evening for us at SICOT Pioneer to host today's webinar. It's the 53rd in our series of Pioneer webinars. And today's webinar entitled Amputee Rehabilitation and Advances in Prosthetics and Orthotics is the second from our rehab committee. A personal note of thanks to SICOT Rehab committee, uh, committee leaders, Professors Lam Choyin and Alaric Arujas for planning and successfully implementing this webinar. Um, before moving on, I'd like in, at this juncture to introduce the moderators for this evening. We have uh, Dr. Tatiana Gershman, who is a consultant pediatric surgeon from Sabara Hospital Infantil in Sao Paulo, Brazil. She is a pediatrics and orthopedic rehabilitation committee member of SICOP. And we have Dr. Samundeswari Sasinda, who is a consultant orthopedic surgeon from the Care Sports Injury Rehabilitation Center in Puducherry, India. She's also an assistant professor at Lakshmi Narayana Institute of Medical Sciences in Puducherry, India. And together, they will be hosting, moderating today's session um, entitled, as we discussed early on. Now, before I log off and hand you over to the moderators, I'd like to remind the global audience following this live webcast, please interact, post your comments and questions in the discussion box as we progress through this webinar. It is indeed this interactivity which makes our sessions interesting, engaging, and of ultimately useful. To our on-demand audience, thank you very much for following us, and we look forward to your enthusiastic support as we journey through. Thank you, Go, for the introduction. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, depending where in the globe you are. Greetings from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I would like to thank the Pioneer team, especially Go, because I'm so fine for making this incredible initiative, the Pioneer webinar, a great success. Also, a special thanks to Dr. Alaric Arugis, our chair in the Orthopedic Rehabilitation Committee. And it's a pleasure to moderate this session with Dr. Samun Swari Sasinder from India. So we from the SICOT Orthopedic Rehabilitation Committee in association with the IAAT, the Indian Association of Assistive Technologists and the GAOT, the Japanese Association of Occupational Therapists are very happy to welcome you all to the amputee rehabilitation and advances in prosthetics and orthotics webinar. 
So today we have very interesting topics and a constellation of faculty. I will introduce uh, them all. Professor Carl, Carl Im Lam from Hong Kong, Kayo, Kayoko Takahashi from Japan, Mr. Prakashi Mehta from India, and Professor Sakti Prasad Das also from India. We encourage all the participants to make questions and comments in the Zoom chat, and we will have time for discussion at the end. So let's start with Professor Kar Im Lam. He's an orthopedic surgeon, professor at the University of Hong Kong, and member of the SICO Orthopedic Rehabilitation Committee. His talk is how I optimize a major lower limb amputee for prosthesis fitting. Please go ahead, Professor Lam. Thank you very much, Katenia, um, for uh, introducing. And now I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me go to the full screen mode. Okay, so this is really my honor to be able to uh, give this talk here and uh, start at, to kick off this uh, event. So as um, the um, moderator has uh, kindly introduced me, I'm uh, from the Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology of the University of Hong Kong, and I'm also a member of CCOT Orthopedic Rehabilitation Committee. Today, the objectives of my talk, in fact, are quite simple. So I would like you to understand the rehabilitation of amputees in the pre prosthetic phase. And in order to achieve it, we need to optimize the residual limb. And also, we should see the amputee as a whole person. So we should focus on these two areas. And to prepare the amputee for prosthesis fitting, so most of the uh, amputation nowadays in more developed uh, region and countries, they are dysvascular amputation. So we usually have some time to optimize the uh, patients and do some rehabilitation before we cut the patient's leg off. And of course, we need to do a lot before we can fit the prosthesis. And in this process, teamwork is really essential. Like a lot of other disciplines in orthopedic rehabilitation. So before we cut the patient's leg off, I think this is very important for us to discuss with our rehabilitation goals and also with the patient. Where, what is our goals, his goal, or her rehabilitation goal? We should talk to them and manage their expectation to alleviate their fears of losing their limbs. And we should align our expectation, make sure that we are in the same page before we proceed to amputation. And of course, this is also a very good opportunity to introduce the multidisciplinary rehabilitation team to the potential amputees. And this is very important to build up report before we really take the limb away. And if in your country or regions, if the peer advisor of amputees are available, they are also a very important uh, resource to the uh, potential amputees, and they can share their experience in going through the journey of the limb loss. This is very important to know the, where it is available in your countries or region. If available, please use it. They are very important companions to our patients. And when we set our rehab goals, of course, we start with a clinical history, examination of the patient, and it depends on the experience of the clinicians, therapists, and prosthetists in the teams. And we together, we can um, make a suggest to the potential amputee a practical rehabilitation goal. And of course, we need to assess the premorbid function, including the cardiopulmonary, the upper limb, and since uh, most of the uh, amputation in more developed country or regions, they are from this vascular problem. Uh, many of the, these patients may have problem in their vision due to hypertensive or DM retinopathy. And in DM patient, diabetes mellitus patient, they can also have neuropathy, which affect the sensation. And of course, um, in this vascular patient, more of them 
most of them, they are uh, of older age and their cognitive function and coordination of movement are also um, important predictors of their successful rehabilitation. And of course, apart from all these functions, we should also assess the activities of daily living, including ambulation. And do not forget, uh, apart from assessing the patient, we should also assess the home environment and the potential social support to the patient. And with this preliminary uh, rehabilitation goal, we can also refine our goal with some standard outcome measure like the Medicare functional classification level, which is commonly known at the K level, or the amputee mobility predictor, which consists of 20 goal-oriented balance and ambulation tasks after the operation. And with this, we can set up a very uh, practical and achievable rehabilitation goal for our potential amputees. And most of us, a lot of us, um, often believe that we should only start the rehabilitation after the operation. In fact, if possible, please start it early and before the operation, especially in this vascular amputation. In traumatic amputation, in place where more accidents happen, it, we may not have this luxury, but if possible, please uh, start it early and recognize and optimize the comorbidity like diabetes mellitus, heart problem, chest problem, renal problem, cognitive impairment, and the sepsis present. And do not forget if the patient need to be immobilized for a longer time, we should not forget the prophylaxis of deep vein thrombosis. And we can also take this window period to prepare the environment and assist the device. And this can save time uh, of the patient staying in the hospital. And if possible, also ask the patient to consider who will be the caregiver if necessary after the amputation. And before operation, apart from all this explanation, expectation management, we should also ask the patient to do one simple thing, stopping smoking and drinking. I think this is uh, simple, but effective in improving the outcome. And our physiotherapist colleague can keep the muscle uh, strong, keep the joint mobile with their uh, physical therapy and maintain their cardiopulmonary function. And this is very helpful for their post-operative period. And do not forget about nutrition. And we should also give pain relief. And there has been studies showing that if you do not control the pain well, there will be more severe uh, residual limb pain afterwards. So do not forget, no one should uh, suffer from unnecessary pain. And after the amputation, I think the first step of good rehab is to do a good surgery. And we should uh, decide an appropriate level of amputation, which should, be, have, uh, should give the patient uh, adequate length in the residual limb with satisfactory wound healing potential. And if necessary, we should get the vascular surgeon's input. And this can be achieved by also by clinical assessment of the uh, limb with uh, other measurements like ankle breaker index, transcutaneous oximetry, and angiogram. But this may not be available in all of the countries and regions um, um, we are talking about. Okay, so one point of notes is that uh, some of us has already started using machine learning uh, of multispectral images of lower limbs and also the clinical risk factor to uh, predict the uh, wound healing. So uh, this is a paper, uh, a recent paper published in 2020. And uh, if you are interested, you can have a look at this. And of course, meticulous surgical techniques is very important. Amputation is not a, an ablative procedure. It's a reconstructive procedure. And, but unfortunately, in some uh, place, uh, this surgery is often uh, delegated to the most junior of the team because uh, some of the senior may not want to do uh, uh, amputation. And you see that in this picture, uh, the wound, obviously, the, I would say the surgical technique is not very meticulous and the wound is not healing. And this gives the patient more complication and suffering. 
and continue to ask the patient to stop smoking. Although nutritional supplement uh, was not really proven, a recent systematic review so that is, there's no uh, statistically significant difference in wound healing, but I think this is no harm to give. And although it may not improve the wound healing, it still gives the patient a good um, um, support of the patient in general. And after operation, I think control of the residual limb volume is very important. If you do not have a stable limb volume, it will be very difficult to fit the prosthesis. How can you achieve it? Of course, in your preference, you may choose rigid dressing uh, with a cast or removable uh, uh, moldable um, uh, external uh, orthosis. But remember, you should avoid pressure over the patella, which is a point uh, prone to have a pressure injury. And depending on the availability, some uh, surgeon may prefer immediate prosthesis fitting. But I think the most simple way is to have a good bandaging and adequate exercise of the residual limb. And if you lift the limb for 15 minutes free without compression, it can already cause a swelling. So um, we should remind our amputee so they should uh, apply the stump bandaging with a gradual decrease in pressure distally to proximally. And one of the reference is that you use half of the full stretch of the bandage and make a figure of eight turn. If you are having a below the amputation, like in this figure, you should go above the knee. If you are having a, an above the amputation, you should go around the waist. And we apply the bandage when you become too loose, too tight, or at least every four hours. So other, if you don't go around the waist or go above the, the knee in different amputation, the bandage may just simply fall off. And if the amputee is not good at bandaging, uh, sometimes you can see them, see this in an uh, aged uh, population, we may use a thumb shrinker to help uh, to control the volume. Okay, and it is also very important to prevent contracture from occurring. Uh, in above the amputation, you cut away part of the adductor and the limb tend to be in an abducted and flexion posture. One simple way to prevent the, the contracture development is to stretch the hip flexor and hamstring with prone lying. Just ask the patient to lie prone four times a day, two hours in total. And like this, if you have a benoni amputation, the knee also tend to be in a fixed position. This is not very really nice. And you can use a knee extension spleen or rigid dressing to control the uh, flexion posture. And apart from the limb, we should not forget the whole person. Uh, please, uh, nutrition and good pain control is very important. We should continue to maintain the cardiopulmonary function and prevent early complication like chest infection, delirium, fumble embolism of the venous uh, system, and pressure injury, and fall. So the patient, after losing their limb, they may not be able to maintain the balance, and they may have fall, and this can damage the residual limb. And our physical therapist colleagues can also uh, prescribe ex exercise to improve the balance, coordination, endurance, and strength, and cardiopulmonary function. This improves the mobility and also the morale, which is also very important. We can progress from parallel bars to more um, um, convenient walking aids. And if available, you can also use the pneumatic aid for mobility, but remember to check the wound condition before and after the use. If the patient feels too exhausting, I think this is also good to do short duration and distance training rather than very long distance and exhausting training. We can do it more frequently uh, so that the patient can achieve more and be less exhausting. And of course, apart from physiotherapists, colleagues, uh, the occupational therapist in our team is also very important. They at these uh, pictures illustrate, they can teach the patient to transfer, to do the toileting, and they can also assess the environment and suggest fitting of hand railing or other assistive device uh, as indicated. One point to note that if the patient is using a wheelchair, 
remember, especially for above knee amputation, when they are bilateral, uh, the center of gravity will become more posterior. When they push the wheelchair, there's a tendency to uh, topple. So remember to put on this anti-tipper and put on brake when the patient is not, uh, when the wheelchair is stationary. And if the patient is having a below the amputation, use a limb support board, which can prevent swelling and contracture occurrence. Pressure injury uh, is also a complication which can prolong and deter and, and make uh, your rehab outcome worse. So remember to avoid pressure on the remaining limb, the sacrum, the trochanter, and the, even the ischium. And if you have pressure injury, this will prolong your stay in the hospital for a long, long time. And last but not least, psychological response. The patient is losing the limbs. They are change, have a body image change. They have deterioration in function and independence, change in level, and they may not be earning as much money as before. And all this will cause a lot of psychological stress. Not every I, I understand that not uh, every rehabilitation team may have uh, the luxury of having a clinical psychologist, but everyone in the, in the team should be compassionate, should be empathetic, and we can use different techniques to uh, assist our patient, like counseling, relaxation techniques, ask the patient to journal their journey and pacing of their activities, and if necessary, of course, we should consult our psychiatric uh, colleagues, and may, we may need pharmacological intervention. So I think um, coming to the end of my talk, I think these are the learning points I would like to share with you. So first, in order to have good rehab, we should have good surgery. Without good surgery, uh, the, limb, the wound is not healing. You will never have a good rehabilitation. And the most important point in the residual limb is that we want to achieve a good wind healing and stable volume. And don't forget the remaining limb and remaining function. We have to strengthen it for the patient to achieve the best rehabilitation outcome and prepare both the limb and the person. No matter whether the, patient, the person is using the basic, very basic type of prosthesis or this advanced more spotty prosthesis, we should keep our um, uh, focus on this uh, rehabilitation to prepare them to have good functional outcome. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, CCOT uh, Rehabilitation Committee to give me this opportunity to uh, share with you this talk. So if you have opportunity, if you have chance to come to Hong Kong, please visit me. And I have this, uh, my email is here and you can also visit the website of our department. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lam, for the brilliant presentation. We'll leave the questions at the end. So continuing, I would like to call Kayoko Takahashi. Dr. Takahashi is an occupational therapist from the Kitasato University, and she's representing the JAOT, the Japanese Association of Occupational Therapy. Her talk is Assistive Technology for Amputees. Please, Dr. Kayo Kayoto. Thank you very much for your introduction. So um, I'm Kayako Takahashi from Japan and I'm an occupational therapist. I'm very excited to have this opportunity to talk about assistive technology for amputees. First, I'd like to talk about the upper extremity amputees and a function of arm. So as you all know that the type of upper arm amputees are uh, categorized by the, um, the places of amputation. For instance, the most common is the transhumeral above el um, elbow amputation and also the transradial, which is below elbow amputation. And we often see them, but we also see different kinds of amputations and also um, this articulation. And in order to do um, occupational therapy services, we need to focus on the function of arm and hands. For instance, um, uh, we usually use our dominant hand for reaching stuff or grasp or pinch to manipulate object. 
And the other hand, which is a non-dominant hand, usually used to hold and stabilize items. And assistive technology is necessary to compensate those functions if those are lost for, um, for various reasons. So um, introducing some of the assistive technology for amputees. So what is assistive technology and products? Uh, there's a definition by the World Health Organization saying that any external product, including devices, equipment, instruments, or um, software, especially produced or generally available, um, the primary purpose of which is to remain or improve an individual's functioning and independence, and therefore promote their well-being. So um, it's not just um, compensating for the function, but also focusing on the well-being. So prosthesis is an, a part of that system of technology. And uh, this is the um, International Classification of Functional Disability and Health ICF model. And as you can see that if the person has an empty prosthesis, usually uh, compensate for the body function and structures. And these are the typical types of prosthesis. Um, for instance, if the person has the transradial um, uh, amputation, they have the um, prosthesis for a forearm and hands. And if the person has the um, amputation for a transhumeral, they have this kind of um, um, prosthesis, which also have an elbow joint and also um, wrist and also hand. And there are a variety of hands um, which can be um, changed or selected according to the uh, function, what the patient wants to do with the um, prosthesis. So um, prosthesis is, uh, it's will compensate for the structure function of upper extremity. And it's very, very important to uh, find the, uh, the match um, according to their needs, what they want to do with this um, prosthesis. Um, however, um, we, uh, as an occupational therapist, we um, also look at the um, well-being and in, in order to do so, um, we have to look at the um, activity levels and also participation level. And sometimes using prosthesis is not good enough to overcome the difficulties or limitation the patient faces. And here we need to introduce some of the assistive devices or assistive technologies for them to uh, be able to do um, certain tasks that they are, which is, which is uh, very meaningful for the patients. And um, in order to um, introduce some of the assistive devices, I try to categorize some of the um, type of performance, how person with amputee um, takes in order to do performance, because um, there are two ways of doing tasks. For instance, with prosthesis or sometimes without prosthesis. And uh, it's very, um, not very uh, proud of the situation in Japan, but not everybody can, um, afford or that not everybody can have a prosthesis in order to um, function in their uh, daily lives. So sometimes they prefer not to use them or sometimes it's not available for them. So there are sometimes um, um, tasks or performances they have to do without a prosthesis. And if the, for instance, um, one of the mother that I, I was seeing who didn't want to wear a prosthesis because she wanted to take care of the baby and she wanted to have a soft um, body touch with the baby. So uh, sometimes it's their own decision what to do with the um, assistive technologies. And um, so if they are not using prosthesis and if they are uh, one of the arm is amputated, they have to do um, performance with only one hand and um, patients need assistive technology to support their activity and participations. And when occupational therapists select um, assistive technology, we usually focus on what kind of um, function that we are trying to assist. For instance, uh, for the patients without a, a prosthesis and using one hand, 
And if the person wants to want to assist with stabilizing object, for instance, when you are usually eating, you use a fork and knives and you need to have the um, non-dominant hand to hold on to the food. But if you cannot have both hand, um, there are multiple um, different kinds of assistive devices, for instance, uh, rocker knife, or sometimes you can use non-slip placement in order to stabilize object. So if you want to um, use something for to stabilize something, uh, those are some of the devices you can introduce to your patients. And uh, it's the same without prosthesis you know, using one hand, but if you are to assist the reach range, for instance, uh, if the person has only one hand, which is not affected, there are certain range of motion they can, use, they can uh, produce. For instance, it's gonna be a bit difficult for them to wash the back of their, um, wash their back. So it might be necessary to um, use long brushes to wash back, or maybe you need to use a reacher to reach for something that is um, far away from you. And without a prosthesis and using one hand, but if the person wants to assist on task on non-affected arm, for instance, if you want to clip your nail, you need to um, use the other hand in order to uh, clip the nail, or you need to use another hand to um, button up the um, cuff sleeve. But if you only have one hand to do so, there are multiple devices you can use. For instance, um, this is the one hand nail clipper. So if you hold, uh, place your hand on it and you push down, uh, you can clip your nail by only one hand. So um, it's gonna be easier for them to uh, perform the task. Or you can also use Velcro or elastic cuff in order for them to um, uh, only slip their hands into the sleeve so uh, they don't have to button up. Uh, if the person wants to use only one hand and wants to do bilateral, bilateral movement, for instance, uh, some of the kids, they will really want to play a game, like a Nintendo Switch is very popular, but if they only have one hand, it's going to be difficult. But there are some controllers that uh, you can connect those two together and you can adjust the angles. So you can only use one hand to play games. Or some of the women, they want to tie their... Um, tie their hair, but it, sometimes it's very difficult. But using only one hand, but use some clipper, um, they could still use uh, one hand and um, dress nicely to do some grooming. So um, there are a lot of different kinds of devices that can support them to perform um, daily activities or their hobbies with one hand. But if you wish to use your uh, prosthesis, prosthesis, but still has some difficulty performing some tasks. For instance, if you want to use the prosthesis as a dominant hand, uh, you need assistance to do a fine motor skills. For instance, for people both, with both hand amputated, uh, you need So you have fine motor skills to button up, or you could use um, special chopsticks. So um, you can use, um, you can still use, use um, prosthesis, but also um, use chopsticks with your um, post-dominant hand. And if you want to use a prosthesis as a non-dominant hand, you need to use prosthesis as to stabilize some of the object. So sometimes you may have to use some um, assistive balls so we can um, hold with your um, prosthesis easily. Or some, if the person wants to play gymnastics or some sports, they have to have some special hands to grasp onto something. So there are a variety of assistive technology for amputees, but um, for, as a therapist, it's very important how we are going to introduce them to the patients. So let me introduce some of the case, one of the case we had. 
he was in uh, in twenties, and he uh, is the concrete manufacturing, and he um, both hand was caught in a press machine for twenty seconds. So um, he had a right arm amputated at the transradial level, and also left arm was amputated as the transhumeral amputation. So it was quite a severe injury. And we saw them after, uh, so as an occupational therapy was prescribed four days after the surgery and uh, pain level was uh, on the visual analog scale was three out of 10. And the stump condition was uh, swollen and uh, FIM, which is functional independent measure was 68, which is um, total in uh, all of the self-care item was um, independent. So he couldn't perform any self-care. And he was very suicidal and depressed when we first saw him. So the goal of occupational therapist was to mental recovery and stump shaping education and also um, prepare himself for uh, prosthesis in the future. So um, first I started to talk to him about what he wants to do uh, and what he used to do when he was um, um, before the injury. And he said he used to love to read comics books every Monday because um, there's a new comics book coming uh, on sale every Monday. So uh, I thought maybe we can start with that. So we created um, a very simple splint that's not putting pressure on the, um, the arm, but um, almost like holding the um, arms to have more uh, some of the function, like for instance, for dominant hand, uh, he um, put the reach, it's like a reacher, but uh, something to, um, how do you say, um, turn the page. And the other hand was to stabilize the uh, comic book. And he was able to read his favorite comics book. So he was very happy. And we he also added a cuff and stick for self-feeding on day 10. And he was um, became more eager to try other activity of daily living. And uh, we tried to analyze the necessary function together uh, as part of the patient education. So he has more knowledge about his conditions and functional. And on day 15, uh, we created assistive technology, or should I say only uh, some equipment for writing because he wanted to write a letter to um, his mother. So he started to give idea to OT uh, how to stabilize the pen. So his problem solving skill improved rapidly from day 15. And on day 27, he returned home and uh, the pain decreased rapidly from three to one and uh, some condition was pretty good. Uh, the, um, the ideal shape of con conical, um, conical shape was um, developed and uh, functional independent measure uh, feeding, grooming, lower dressing, and toileting. Everything was uh, independent. And for the mental status, he was very motivated to rehabilitation and try prosthesis. And he um, went to the rehabilitation center after discharge to um, practice uh, prosthesis. So having a su successful completion on a meaningful task using assistive technology can give patients confidence and increase motivation to try other tasks. And patient education and problem solving techniques encourage patients to um, gain coping skills. And it's very important for them to move on to the next level. So as a summary, um, importance of assistive technology for amputation, there are three levels of um, importance. First, as a functional level, uh, it can restructure the body image he, um, the person, patient lost. And also use um, arm um, amputated um, limb can decrease edema and uh, can be a very good condition, um, good to um, say uh, control the conditions. And at the activity level, uh, of course, independence in self-care or ADL or any activities they wish they could perform. So um, that's a big goal. And the third level is a participation level. So um, using assistive technology can reduce psychological agitation and also um, can empower the patient to um, self-fulfillment or self-actualization. So as a conclusion, assistive technology, including processes, are tools to let patients live their life to its fullest. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Kayo. Kayoko for this 
very interesting presentation. Thank you. Continuing our, our webinar, I would like to call Mr. Prakash Mehta. He's uh, graduated in prosthetics and orthotics engineering, founder, member, and president of the IAAT, the Indian Association of Assistive Technology. And his talk is Advances in Lower Limb Orthotics. Please, Mr. Mehta. Is just share the presentation, yeah. oh. the presentation mode, and it's good. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we uh, can. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, okay. a very, very good evening to all of you. Uh, I'm Prakash Mehta from India, of course. And it's, uh, it has been a long journey uh, to have reached to you people, uh, this August group of Seaport. Thank you one and all for this opportunity uh, given. And uh, the topic which has been given to me is advanced lower limb orthotics, okay? And uh, to begin with, of course, uh, I would like to, mm, yeah, what is an orthosis? Basically the definition part of it is, orthosis is a support to the weakened part of the body due to paralysis, injury, or any other reason to perform the functional activity recovery, which help for the quality living of life as per the suitability of an individual need. An external device to support or immobilize the affected part. Okay, so this is basically in uh, uh, what I I'll be talking uh, a few things. Ah, uh, and the principle of orthosis, it is basically corrective protective, resistive, preventive, supportive, which I find definitely improves the uh, mobility also in patients, immobilizes to facilitate the recovery, to correct the biomechanical alignments, reduces pain and helps pain weight bearing. So this basically is uh, the principle of the orthosis. Now the function of the orthosis it controls, guides, limits, or immobilizes an extremity, joint, or body segment for a particular reason to restrict the movement in a given direction to assist movement generally to reduce weight bearing forces for a particular purpose to aid rehabilitation from fractures after the removal of the cast to otherwise correct the shape or function of the effective body to provide easier movement capability or reduces the pain. Mm. Come now to the biomechanical principle of orthosis, the 3.4 pressure system, that is one of the mandatory things in any orthosis being prepared. In any orthosis or, or orthosis equipment, uh, you need to remember this particular Bible guideline, which has been, uh, which is very effective to be used by all of us, and that is the three point pressure system. Then the reloading mechanism, where the pressure is to be added upon where the pressure has to be uh, removed. Ah, so that is another very important aspect of it. And the role of gravity, whether it is the antagonist group of muscle or the agonist group of muscle, which have to be taken care of, ah, we definitely have to keep this in mind. Now, coming down to the latest, as far as lower limb orthotics are concerned, uh, there are a lot of changes which have definitely come up in the prosthetic segment. But as far as the orthotic part is concerned, uh, not really much has been uh, noticed as far as what I have been seeing in the last 46, 47 years of my 
uh, being into this particular profession. Uh, like in the initial days, we had these toe raising splints. Then this was uh, one of the easiest modalities. Now the toe raising splint was very, very cumbersome and uh, the dorsiflexors were put to uh, work at a very long time. So we discarded it and then came these night splints wherein you wanted the dorsiflexors to be kept in proper position when the patient was in night. Uh, uh, when the patient was in lying mode, and we had the derotation bar fitted onto the patient, uh, specifically in the hemiplegics and uh, paraplegics, where uh, the two, the foot was going to go in external rotation. Then we came down. Then we can definitely look into the uh, baloney caliper, uh, which uh, was one of the most widely used uh, orthosis. As far as a baloney, uh, an AFO was concerned, uh, which had the uh, provision of having a round spur means to be uh, power around the dorsiflexes of the foot as well as the plantar flexes were there to some extent and they could do it. Then we had in this, we in case of uh, the weak dorsiflexes means uh, he had foot drop. Uh, so we had the foot drop. It's the, in the very same the steps we were organizing. And then in case of uh, where uh, the patient had uh, some amount of movement, uh, it was limited range of motion uh, that was given. In cases of where the patient was having uh, a heat strike, uh, that was which was, and the uh, calcaneal uh, was being put to the foot. So therein, the anterior stop was taken care of and that was responsible for creating uh, uh, the plant affliction as such. Now, these are a few of the night splints which came up later uh, with change of the material uh, which went on and the heavier things were discarded and we came down to the polypropylene and the other uh, light materials, uh, the plastics, they came into uh, what was there. And uh, you can see on the extreme left, like uh, you have the AFO that is uh, it is uh, usually basically a night split. It has got a derotation bar also fitted into it. And then these splints actually, uh, another very important thing is when we are fitting the splint, you must know the time and everybody must know when exactly what time is the splint really going to be taking care of your patient. It reaches an orthotis, basically. That is what I have seen. By the time the patient starts developing, ah, so uh, uh, the deformity is another thing. Ah, in India, of course, I have been seeing this in the last, now things are changing. Now things are changing. Ah, so this needs to be very well taken care of. The last picture on the left, you can see that the foot is already there in equinus. Why did this, why did, the, why did we allow this to happen? This should not have been there. So the role of providing a splint ah, with the PMR and anybody who is prescribing ah, should be very, it should be very well taken care of. Similarly, in cases of club foot, okay, this is CTV. In CTV, <coughs> now you have seen that a lot of, lot of people have entered uh, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have met uh, Mitchell Steenbeck also. Now, his prints have come up called as the Steenbeck brace. And in that, uh, the shoes are kept in abduction and the bar is placed in between. And the bar is just of the shoulder height and blah, blah, blah. So, which side, if it is a unilateral, the foot is kept in a bit of abduction, the other side, and, and there is a reduction so that the uh, varus is very well taken care of. Now, these are the splints which we have produced here in India. And I'm sure that uh, everybody here on the screen must be liking it. It is called as the Nachetan uh, splints and they are wonderful. It is taking care of the four foot virus. It is a plastic splint. Uh, with the naked eyes, you can see that the heel is touching the uh, plate of the Lower, uh, lower portion of the splint. The splint is malleable, so it can be pushed. And then uh, this particular strap, 
is there to take care of the erosion what the patient has and it's a wonderful spread. It, it, it is uh, just and uh, after every two or three months this particular thing can be changed and it's not very expensive. This is make in India. Uh, what we are definitely looking forward for, we are trying to develop our newer skills, trying to improve our own skills and we are trying to come over to make in India what our uh, Prime Minister Mr. Narin Modi has been focusing upon. Now this happens to be the last one on the right happens to be the spin, which is called the Marmite spin. And this is, of course, very good and uh, basically used for, uh, as a shoe insert for patients with foot drop. Now, this is another variety of things, like when you can see, this is the CTV spin, then you have the uh, Sarmiento brace. Oh, this is the latest, what, has, what we use here. Uh, in India, it is a fracture brace, and for these conditions, of course, like uh, uh, the complete, uh, it is a total contact brace, and uh, it is very easy for the patient to wear it. Down and doffing off is very easy. It's very light in weight, very very acceptable to the patient, and he can wear a shoe over it, and he can propel, and the. Uh, Fracture site is very well uh, taken care of. Then you have the compression garments as such. These compression garments, uh, the middle one on the top, this, this is very, very essential in cases of uh, these days here in India, what we find is there is a lot of diabetic problems what we are seeing and it is throughout the whole globe. But as far as India is concerned, uh, we are definitely... Uh, heading to be the leaders as far as diabetes is concerned. Okay, so here these tokens now uh, are taking care of uh, the problems, and specifically, it is uh, told to the patient that this it's going to be very helpful to you in reducing down your edema and uh, the venous return and all that is whichever is hampered or in cases of DVT where the patients are kept. Uh, uh, for long lying down in bed, uh, the DVT stockings, they are very, very essential and very important. Then the other splints, what we see is uh, the leaf spring orthosis, which is basically for foot drop. Uh, it is used as a foot drop insert. Uh, it is just wonderful. Uh, I have been using, uh, in the past, we were using basically the uh, auto box systems, which are which were from, uh, which everybody is aware of, but now we are readily uh, repairing it for our own self here in India. And then you have the silicon heel cups for plantar fasciitis or calcaneus spurs, where uh, for calcaneus spurs, of course, we separate it. There are so many conditions as far as lower extremity are there. Around the ankle, if you have problems, we have the inflammable ankle supports, okay? The, on the top, the last one. Ah, so you can, the air cushion, uh, cushioning is done and ah, with that we uh, pressurize the tan uh, in cases of fracture, fibula and uh, where uh, not much is really to be done by an orthopedic surgeon, rather it would have been a uh, fracture tibia, ah, it would have worked, but in cases of fracture, fracture fibula where, uh, not, where the weight bearing is not a real concern, ah, these prints are being used in plenty. Uh, around the ankle, if you have some uh, twist or strain or strain, uh, these ankle wraps, uh, they have also come up and we use them in plenty here. This is another a very, very interesting uh, Belloni air car shoes, which have come up, the short ones and the long ones. And uh, everybody must be using this, practically all the uh, who want to really go back to the offices and all that. And in case that they have uh, uh, basically in fibula fractures of course this is or uh, metatarsals or something like uh, you can you can take help of these and the patient is uh, put to speedy recovery and the patient goes back to his office at the possible earliest okay now here if you look into these are the various type of knee braces which have come up uh, 
like three races, open Patila, Hindu race, then you have an open Patila, and even for sportsmen, you have like the new races have been developed. Uh, the, uh, so many of them, the checkout courses and uh, the medial bar or courses that is there, uh, which takes care of the virus and virus. Uh, we have come up and it is indigenous prepared in India where we are taking care of it. Like here, if you look into this particular, the, the first one on the second line, uh, this is an OAE race, uh, basically used for osteoarthritis, early osteoarthritis. If it is put in properly and tied properly, taken for granted, the three-point pressure system is very well taken care of. And uh, you will definitely find that the patient does not really require TKR. We have seen plenty of cases, and if the brace is provided to the particular patient in time, uh, the TKR can definitely be avoided. This is a wonderful splint, uh, and uh, we, are, we are having these patients in plenty as far as uh, this part of the country is concerned. And then for the ACL, PCL, we have n number of various splints, M4, M3. Uh, there are variety of uh, knee braces which have come up. Now we have knee braces, uh, the double bar knee braces or the single bar knee braces uh, of various uh, companies which are there. And there are so many of them uh, which can definitely make the patient uh, back to sports also, even for sports injury, wherein the patient uh, whose, whose life is dependent upon his, uh, his activities as such, uh, for them, these braces are proving to be a boon for them, okay? I was talking about the Indian technology, the ready-made knee brace. This is, uh, in case of Genuar or Genuarga, the very same brace can be used for both of them. Like, this is one brace, and it is definitely, like, it is going to be new for the complete gen uh, all of you. Like, this corrective, this is one pressure, this is the second one, and this is the third one. And if you really take care of it and a bit of exercise and the wedges are provided in the shoe, the medial and the lateral, depending upon what is to be given, ah, they prove to do wonders. And within a period of time, the TKR is definitely forgotten. So people return back to their normal activities like this. Now, these are the above knee splints, the uh, shot knee brace, open patella. Then this is, you could call it one of the knee braces for the uh, knee as such. Uh, and wherein uh, you have uh, the medial meniscal here. Uh, so the lat part is very, being very well taken care of. Now, moving on to the hip. Now, this has again got a variety of things. Like in the initial days, we had uh, plasters being given like this, and then we had uh, Van Rosen splints and uh, the public harness, and then we had uh, the Dennis Brown splints, which were applied to the patient. Uh, we had these type of systems also where the patient could have, uh, to whatever extent you wanted the abduction to happen, uh, you could have abducted if it was a unilateral case. In, in bilateral cases, uh, you could have taken care of the hinges being provided onto the joint and the amount of abduction, what was, whatever was desired. Then this was uh, the spica, which was provided to the patient, uh, whatever amount of uh, degree of abduction and uh, flexion you wanted uh, could have been achieved by this. Uh, so with the latest time, like uh, when the patient was... Uh, about to get up around the hip. Uh, it was uh, in, we have a lot of uh, patients coming up cerebral palsy these days, wherein you must be finding a lot of uh, the erector tendon, the scissor gate and all that happening. In those cases, the choice of brace, what we came up was something similar to the, the, this particular brace. Uh, the swash brace, the sitting, walking and standing hip orthosis was the latest one what we, uh, are doing it here in uh, like this this particular thing is the uh, indigenous version uh, of the swash brace what we were using previously. Ah, so this is what we are doing and 
this is the latest what is being carried out. Then the latest uh, what we are practicing upon here in uh, these days is the public harness. Uh, that, that public harness is again a wonderful orthosis which can be given to patients of uh, hip abduction for, for, for creating hip, hip, hip abduction. Uh, then you have around the hip, you have quite a number of so many of them and it was practically, I had to be very short with things. So uh, uh, I came up with fracture bracing and low temperature thermoplastics like in the initial days it was plastic and the gypsum and then we came up with the aluminum things and then now it is the orbit spintage time like the low temperature thermoplastics uh, which have come up. And Mr. Mehta, uh, excuse yeah. me, we are yeah. running out of time. Right, if you right. could please okay. uh, go a little bit okay. faster okay. And, and your presentation. Sorry. But so this, uh, yeah. The time. Uh, this, uh, right. I'm sorry. Uh, just another two minutes, okay? This is the RGO system, the reciprocating, reciprocating gate or process, uh, which is basically used for paraplegics. Uh, not all of them, uh, uh, but we definitely take care of this and uh, and that is all for my end. I knew that I was, I, I had to rush. Uh, and that's why I literally could not, uh, I was compelled to keep the pictures and slides. Uh, and thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, right. Mr. Right. Mehta. Thank you. Right. So uh, to complete our expert panel, I would like to call Dr. Sakti Prasad Das. Dr. Das is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, director of the Padme Care Hospital in India and a member of the SICA Rehabilitation Committee. Uh, he talk is the latest developments of prosthetic knee joints. Please, um, Dr. Das, go ahead. Good evening, good morning to all of you. Am I audible, madam? Yes. My screen is visible. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh good. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, rehab committee or the rehab committee for giving me this opportunity. And uh, um, uh, many things has already been cleared by Professor Lam regarding this amputee preparation of the amputee preparation of the patient. Many things has been clarified already. Uh, and most important thing in, in this uh, prosthetic system is lower limb is the knee joint. So we, I will discuss about the developments in the knee joint. Mm -hmm. My screen is not moving. Mm -hmm. We can see a presentation. You can just uh, set the pr so, presentation in the viewer. So it's huge in the screen. So um, the there important, you go. So important causes of amputations are many types of circulatory and vascular problems, diabetes complications, cancer and trauma. So most important is difficult is the transfemoral amputee in the walking ability since both the knee and ankle joints are lost. So that's why the important is the uh, knee joint. The prosthetic knee is the most important joint of the lower limb prosthesis for the transfemoral amputee. Ambrose Pare in the 6th century considered as the inventor of the transfemoral prosthesis. For a components of the prosthesis, you'll find one is a socket, another is a suspension system, another is a knee joint, a pylon, and ankle and a foot. So these are the uh, pro uh, sockets. This is the knee joint and pylon and this is the foot component. Basically knee joint is necessary for the transfemoral amputees as well as uh, hip disarticulation prosthesis. And these are the knee joints as well as the foot. We will concentrate more on knee joints. 
so this is that prosthesis trial is going on this is the socket this is the knee joint this is the pylon and this is the foot which is done covered with the shoe so successful function of a prosthesis depends on selecting the correct knee to fit the person's age health activity level and lifestyle many things these things are already discussed by professor lam so somebody it not a, any type of knee joint cannot be fitted to any every person so all activity level everything is different for a person a child amputee a very active person and a, a child a, a person with who is a old man for everybody the, the demands are different so for that we have to understand the gait cycle so in the gait cycle most important thing in the knee knee moves two times flexion and two time extension so in the for example the heel strike it is the extension and in the mid swing uh, is a flexion so these are the various it goes and so so it is a goes to the flexion and extension so these are the various types of uh, knee position in very in the gait cycle so re our requirements are when the person is standing we will need stability it should lock and unlock because once somebody starts moving means walking means it should unlock and this should be controlled mobility knee should move it otherwise it will be move here and there and it should durable and it should comfort to the best person as well as cosmetically accepted so what is the role of a surgeon already discussed by professor lam surgical planning decision making and how the residual limb will be how the muscle muscle strength so all has to be prepared after the amputation for the prosthetic fitting short residual limbs no doubt is difficult to suspend resulting poor stability so if you classify the prosthetic knee joint it has either a mechanical or computerized basically mechanical is again single axis and polycentric single axis is either stable so it should be for stability it should be manually locking or it should be weight activated locking and for the polycentric variety the, the muscle should be either constant flexion or variable flexion and this should be in the swing phase again in the swing phase there should be hydraulic and pneumatic so these are the mechanisms we discuss computerized there are the hybrid mechanisms as well as the microchip control so these are the various types of classification of the prosthetic knee joint single axis knee joint simplest type of prosthetic knee joint has a simple hinge and it moves in a single axis and it has got a fixed center rotation no mechanical stability so the individuals who use this type of knee requires good muscle strength and as well as the voluntary control so these are the examples of the single axis knee joints polycentric knee joint is the most important thing Poly it allows multiple joints it has got a, either a four bar or seven bar linkage and it the, the stability it is a stable because the center of rotation is located approximately and posterior when the knee is fully extended and swing phase it leads to shortening which helps in the ground clearance so this is typically recommended active people and who are more likely to walk independently without a gait aid so these are the examples of the polycentric knee joint these are the multiple centers of rotation so it needs stability from um, by the manual technique or by the weight activated method so these are the prosthesis manually somebody can lock and unlock in the manual uh, there are some uh, strings or or some wires are there by pulling they can lock and unlock and they, it can be used these are one type of knee joints and these are the very stable it allows automatic lock and also manually unlock the knee to sit with a bent knee person has to when they are working it is okay but when they have to sit they have to unlock it another is weight activated stand control this knee basically provides a constant fixation force while weight is on the limb this helps to prevent it from buckling when standing on that leg while still aligned to swing freely when on weight so for recently amputated ones short as well limbs and extensor weakness this weight activated stand control needs are necessary mobility for mobility purpose there is a constant fixation and a variable fixation variable fixation again hydraulic or pneumatic these are the advanced form of prosthetic knee joints so if you use the constant fixation for the variable fixation all knee systems require some degree of swing control to maintain a consistent gait otherwise there will be the it cannot match with the other limb and there may be quick or fast flexion or extension which will create in not in a proper gait pattern 
so there is a constant friction system the knee which means it will apply a breaking force as the patient puts weight on the prosthesis to prevent the knee from buckling the rest of the time the knee will swing freely until the weight is applied to variable friction it provides increased resistance as the knee bends from full extension this allows variable working speed however this system requires frequent adjustment and replacement of moving parts so in what is the mechanic the mechanism in the fluid control by pneumatic or hydraulic in each case piston move through the control medium as the knee bends and extends as the piston move the valves provide varying degree of resistance depending on the angle of the knee joint so the, the our, this is fitted with the established um, uh, developed knee joint polycentric knee joint these are the added control systems are added with the um, uh, this um, um, polycentric knee joints so pneumatic it uses air and hydraulic it uses some oil only while the while the, the person will from swing page when you bend the knee so it has a control because this this gives some resistance so for example this these are the models these these are the bar linkage four bar or seven bar linkages knee joints basically and these are fitted with the either a hydraulic system or pneumatic system and, and ultimately there is a coverage or housing so it looks like this it can be fitted with the um, uh, in the above knee amputee so uh, the, these are the basically knee, knee, pneumatic and the hydraulic here is the hydraulic system here is the pneumatic system but joints are fixed these are the polycentric knee joints so another is micro process of control how it helps it continuously controls the flexion and extension knee joint using a microcomputer system throughout the stance phase or swing phase of each gait cycle. So these knees have microprocessors to allow feedback from the within the knee or foot joint. So this gives feedback to the uh, knee or foot joint. So informs of the sensors adjust the range and speed of the knee flexion and extension according to the user's requirements. Sensors monitor knee position during swing and pressure sensors detecting ground related position during the stance phase. So these are the uh, electronically controlled um, 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 various types of microprocessor control knee joints. So what are the constraints of the microprocessor? It is high cost, no doubt requires required charging, they large and heavy. So how to select a knee joint? No doubt, this is the, this is the decision between the rehabilitation team, the, the surgeon, the prosthetist, the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, all have to take a decision regarding pre-op, pre, pre op, op, as well as the post-op, even during the treatment and after treatment also. So each they have different features that will influence the gait of the individual, as well as the rehabilitation with regard to sitting down or standing up, ramp, stairs, uneven terrain, walking and different speeds. So it has to be selected. So suppose a single axis knee joint. Single axis knee joint are used in the younger population. Manual or automatic blocking of the flexion can be used in users with poor muscle power. So this is when there is a economic limitation, this can be used. These are the economical. So low level community ambulator, this can be used. And the hydraulic pneumatic systems are used for active worker, work, workers. And it permits increased working, comfort, speed, and symmetry. And microprocessor knee, it reduces tumbles and falls. It increases self-selected working speed, working speed on uneven terrain, and having metabolic efficiency during gait. So, recent technological advances, including the addition of microprocessor controls, have resulted in prosthetic needs, which offer excellent stand stability and enhance swing phase responsiveness. Proper application of today's advanced prosthetic technology allows the active patient with an amputated limb to participate in a broad range of vocational and avocational activity, including recreational and competitive sports. However, rehabilitation teamwork, a better outcome for the persons with an amputation will come from repeated consultation with the orthopedic surgeon, prosthetist, optometherapist, and a physiotherapist before surgery, after surgery, and before or after the prosthesis fitting. So with this, I conclude my lecture and thank you all for giving me this, I mean, this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Das. So uh, continuing, um, I would like to thank you all for the great talks. And I'll call now Dr. Samu Diswari.
Sassin there to continue with the conclusion and keynotes, and then we'll take the questions. Temo, please. I hope my screen is visible. Yeah. Uh, on behalf of uh, Ortho Rehabilitation Committee, I would like to thank all the Galaxy of speakers who have uh, given us the various uh, uh, talks. And then uh, to put in nutshell. Uh, first, uh, from Professor Lam, it was a brilliant talk that you have put it uh, the, for the importance of uh, team rehabilitation and uh, how to optimize an amputee and also to uh, utilize the maximum resources which are available in different countries and regions. And you have also put a stand on front as well as the social support and the standard outcome measures which we need to use for assessing post, uh, post operatively for an amputee to assess how the progress of uh, our uh, rehabilitation goes on and the importance of various clinical parameters which we have to assess preoperatively uh, to assess the limb vascular status, to concentrate on the nutritional and supplemental needs. And also you have put a, a title on machine learning analysis, which uh, I think we will all go back and indeed it was an interesting topic. And the various steps to control the residual volume after an amputation and the various measures to prevent the contractures. Uh, and also to teach the importance of activities of daily living and the need for post-operative rehabilitation. And very important is you have uh, you have put a need on the measures to prevent the psychological response, the need for supportive care and psychological treatment, which we need to take care for our uh, patients. Next is uh, an, a brilliant and excellent and innovative talk by Dr. Kayako. And uh, it was extraordinarily a uh, good talk that uh, you have uh, given us upper, for the uh, upper limb and extremities and various functions of the arm. And the importance of assistive technology for uh, this particular uh, this particular amputated rehabilitation. You have introduced and taken to us through various types of prosthesis products which are used and uh, which are being used for uh, promotion of well-being of the patient. At the end of the day, that is the main goal uh, which we are all getting focused on and and you have also insisted that it is the important goal of being an occupational therapist and uh, you have also taken to us through various types of uh, this uh, products such as the hand the transradial and the humerus uh, transhumeral uh, upper extremity products and the performance of these products and uh, Thank you for showing us with uh, brilliant cases which you have uh, seen clinically and showing us the results. Uh, that gives us uh, extra strength that uh, we can take our patients uh, to uh, get their optimal functions uh, uh, with the help of this uh, upper limb amputative devices, with the help of an occupational therapist. And uh, it makes me to feel that we should also conduct a workshop to learn how uh, effective an occupational therapist uh, is, uh, is uh, keen in giving us such a good functional outcomes. And it's so impressive, uh, I appreciate it. And the next talk is by Dr. Prakash Mehta. Your was an interesting presentation and you give us a, a brilliant talk on teaching us the various principles of orthosis and you have put a knee on the lower extremity orthosis the important biomechanical principles and what are the latest advances we have for the lower limb orthosis. As a sports surgeon, it was quite impressive for me to uh, see on various uh, uh, like uh, orthosis which are used, being used for ankle injuries because these injuries are often neglected or often underestimated. And I don't see many of the surgeons being using these kind of orthosis support 
for a grade one or grade two anticipants. And I keenly insist on using these kind of supportive devices for the rehabilitation of the patients. Dr. Sakti, as usual, your talk was really brilliant and you have given us the latest development of various prosthetic knee joints and the basic components of the prosthesis and how to choose the right prosthesis, the various requirements, the importance of surgeons. And you have also uh, showed us the new role of microprocessor sensors in the development of these prosthetic knee joints and the indication for hydraulic knee prosthesis on the excuses. Um, Thank you, thank you once again to all the galaxy of speakers for uh, taking us through the various uh, various uh, innov innovations which are being used for this uh, rehabilitation of amputees. Uh, next, before taking us the questions, I would like to uh, pose the slide uh, to fill out the post webinar survey so that you can receive a personalized certificate of attendance. And I would also take the opportunity on behalf of uh, uh, Sikot Education Academy uh, to invite you to our next webinar on role of limb reconstruction in grade 3 open 3 fractures which will be conducted on Friday 12th May 2023. Please add it to your local Google calendars and register for the same. I take privilege to invite each and every one of the attendees and speakers over here to attend so that we can have a physical meet on Sikot uh, Cairo, Egypt, please submit your abstracts at the earliest before 30th April so that you can have an opportunity to project your work. Yeah. Thank you, one and all. With this, we can take a couple of questions from the audience which we have got. Uh, the first question is over to you. Uh, Dr. Lam, uh, from the audience, uh, in case of an emergency trauma with a miss indicating amputation, what should be the protocol of counseling and preoperative rehabilitation? Um, yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. I think this is also very important and illustrate the difference between a dysvascular amputation and traumatic amputation. Of course, uh, in traumatic amputation, you follow the protocol of management of major trauma and you save the life of the patient and save as much limbs as possible. And in this case, we really don't have a very good um, opportunity to do preoperative counseling or uh, preoperative uh, uh, rehabilitation. But I would advise that when, as soon as the patient is stabilized, when they are conscious, stable in emotion, we can start uh, talking about the life after amputation, maybe get a peer advisor, and talk more about the possible functional outcome and choices and journey of rehabilitation. So uh, this will be my answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lam. Uh, the next question will be to Professor Dr. Shakti. Uh, Osteo-integrated lower limb prosthesis or in use in developed countries. What is the success rate of osteo-integrated upper limb prosthesis? Osteo integration uh, procedure is not practiced very frequently in our country. So we are not exposed to so much of uh, osteo integration techniques, basically, in this part of the world and specifically our country. So, no doubt, it has been about the literature and what are the cases we have seen and what are many, some cases also have been done in our country. Yes, so good results. So upper lower limb, okay, but upper limb, I cannot have so a practical experience to tell uh, or to inform the, uh, the question now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shakti. Uh, to you, Dr. Kayako, uh, do you think there is any role of artificial intelligence on recent advances like target sensory re-innovation of nerves or target muscle re-innovation or target sensory innovation in processes? Will it be a boon or ban? Uh, can you share your experience? Oh, oh, that's a very good question, but I don't have any experience with AI. So um, I'm sorry, but I, I don't have a good answer to the question. Can, it, uh, can we make it the open question to all the speakers? So if any one of you can have experience with the uh, role of artificial intelligence or the use of recent advances like target sensory innovation, of nerves or muscles and uh, these kind of uses in prosthesis. Can you share your experience with this? 
uh, Samu, maybe I can uh, give a give a short answer to this question. Um, AI and and big data. I think uh, for MPT rehabilitation, we uh, in my institute we haven't used it, but we use it for other application in orthopedics and in rehabilitation. It definitely give us an other uh, a vision, which we can see the relationship between some uh, predictive factors and the outcomes of rehabilitation and orthopedic surgery, uh, which we cannot see with just our bare eyes or just uh, the conventional uh, analytical method. Um, so I think this will be uh, continuing to uh, develop and we will see more uh, benefit of these uh, advance in technology in the future. And about the uh, re-innovation, uh, sensory re-innovation, I have no experience, but one of the surgeons in my center did a few cases of uh, target muscle re-innovation. Uh, still too early to talk about the result, but I know uh, uh, some French surgeons, they have uh, more experience. Uh, we are still evaluating the final outcomes, but uh, seems that it's also a good, apart from the fitting of a more advanced uh, electro, uh, myoelectric uh, prosthesis, the procedure can also improve the phantom pain and uh, residual limb pain. I, I think this can be useful in uh, carefully selected candidates. Uh, so this is my experience. Thank you very much. Dr. Mehta, would you like to add on something? Well, it was uh, what uh, what do you want me to add upon uh, actually the only thing what i could uh, what i wanted to speak on was uh, a few other things that time constraint was definitely there and uh, like there were quite a number and specifically as far as the august gathering amongst whom i'm sitting down right now uh, i'm sure you all are far, far, far better off and more acknowledged to what I know. So uh, it's because of Dr. Das, like uh, he, uh, he, he is the one because of whom I'm here, I suppose. And uh, he said, whatever you have, you have to express out and uh, your experiences of the last 45, 46 years of being here in this particular profession. And uh, so that is it. Uh, uh, nothing much like uh, we all should definitely take it, uh, take a step forward as uh, the assistive technology is concerned and uh, uh, yes uh, these type of meetings uh, it must be happening happening with a lot with the orthopedic surgeons and the bmrs uh, but uh, uh, in this august group are getting an uh, a chance to speak on what exactly we are on with and how we can Together, bring a difference. Ah, I'm sure okay, this uh, this is going to create awareness in the people that yes, what's going on, and together we can and we will. That is what I'm aiming forward for. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Dr. Mehta. Yeah, uh, Doctor Sakti, this will be the last question uh, from the audience. Uh, I would like to uh, point it to you. Is uh, BKA better? Better than SIMS amputation in terms of prosthesis fitting, mobility, and patient satisfaction. Please again, please again, repeat again. Is below knee amputation better than SIMS amputation in terms of prosthesis fitting, mobility, and patient satisfaction? Hey, um, um, below knee amputation, that all of the, these are both are separate things. SIMS amputation, it has got its own. Prosthesis type of uh, all of different type of prosthesis. Below knee amputee has got different type of prosthesis. Science stomp has got other advantages. Below knee prosthesis has some disadvantages. Science amputee's advantages patient can go barefooted in the home also. So mm -hmm. always do, they do not need prosthesis. So it has got always said they both are different things. So um, today's my, my topic is on knee joint. So no doubt all the prosthesis, what I have seen my also say. 25, 26 years, all the prosthesis, whatever uh, may be the stump. Now, due to the CAD CAM mechanism, any type of socket can be prepared, and the prosthesis with the prosthesis, patient are comfortable. They can work depending upon their activity level. May not be very high 
uh, recreational type of activity, but everything is possible. At least they are able to do their all own, own activities of daily living with the prosthesis, whatever available also today. Any type of amputation. Prosthetists are ready to fit all types of prosthesis to any type of amputation. That is my uh, uh, experience in this. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. With this, I would like to conclude the session on our second uh, webinar on orthopedic rehabilitation with advances in amputation and uh, rehabilitative devices. Uh, thank you, all speakers, and uh, thank you, Tatiana, for joining me today for moderating the session. I would like to thank our chairman, Dr. Alarik, for providing us an uh, opportunity to share our knowledge on this particular topic. Thank you very much. So, from my side, I'd like to thank the moderators, uh, Tatiana and Dr. Sasinder. Uh, very nicely done. I think all the talks went really well. There were some good uh, questions from the audience as well. Uh, thank you very much to Seacott uh, Pioneer and the head office for uh, all the logistic support and the, the help they've provided over the last uh, few months in setting up this, uh, this webinar. So thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.